there we go. All right, today we're going to do a little history lecture, which is a little different than usually uh, what we get at SAIC. I'm going to talk about the presidents. Um, we're going to be covering the presidents of John Quincy Adams to um, William McKinley. Now, um, I chose these presidents because the four of them are the founding fathers, and then after them, the more famous Teddy Roosevelt's and FDR's and Truman's and Reagan's. And these are sort of the forgotten people. I mean, of these 20 presidents who had served between 1825 and 1901, most of us can only name maybe a Jackson or a Lincoln, yet these 20 men have all their own unique stories, uh, some good, some bad. Uh, you know, it was a time in the time of the Victorian era of when the presidents, well, the, they were more of just a figurehead of like today. The U.S. was more ruled by the Senate and the Supreme Court and the president was just a figurehead of the U.S. and not actually making that many political decisions. So, uh, let's start. John Quincy Adams, president looks a lot like a, um, black crested gibbet. John Quincy <laughs> Adam, known as both old man eloquent to his friends and the madman of Massachusetts to his enemies. Um, the first president to place his hand on a law book rather than a Bible. Also once accused of being a pimp. Probably most famous for being John Adams' son. Also would have probably the oddest White House head of a gator, which would live in the White House bathtub. was actually given to him by a French general, um, Lafayette, who uh, helped us win the American Revolution. Also, another little uh, fun fact about Adams, loved to swim naked in the Potomac, the Potomac being the river that runs around D.C. every single day. He would give it a nice hour-long swim every day. Not actually a photo of him swimming naked in the Potomac. Doing so would also cause him to give the first time in American history a president's interview to a woman when a um, British reporter would actually sit on his clothing uh, while he was naked swimming in the river and refused to get off until he granted her that first interview. Also, I love this quote. The art of making love muffled up in furs and open air with the thermometer zero is truly a Yankee invention, and probably true. Um, also, Quite a proponent of the hollow earth theory. Um, he believed in this man, Symes. So, Symes theorized that in the North Pole was actually this giant hole which would lead to the center of the earth, which would actually be inhabited by moment. So, John Quincy made this whole plan to send an expedition to the North Pole, find these mold people. Unfortunately, the crazy road trip never came to be as Adams left off this before anything could be done. And as luck would have it, his successor, Jackson, thought the earth was flat, so the expedition was canceled. And Adams, well, he would have a stroke and die in the Capitol building, vehemently extreme, exclaiming no, and then falling dead in response to a proposed bill, collapsing at his desk. So next we have Andrew Jackson. I'm very good to know. We have a few photographs of Andrew Jackson, though these are taken after his presidency. Old Hickory, as he was known. I mean, this man would fight in over a hundred duels, being shot in the arm, being shot in the chest. Most of them were fought over the honor of his wife. I mean, he was said to walk around like a bag of marbles. Um, I mean, at one point, this dude with this man would um, injure his honor. So he lets the man shoot first. He shoots Jackson in the chest. And then Jackson holds off for a second, steadily aims his pistol, kills the man. I mean, he later said, had he shot me in the brain, I still would have killed him. Um, then, during his presidency, the first assassination of attempt of a president. So he is visiting Washington's um, grave, and a man comes in with two pistols, fires both, both misfire, actually. And then Jackson has to be held back from mercilessly beating him near to death with his cane. So there's this whole theory that the ghost of Washington actually protected Jackson because later when they tried both pistols and inquiry, both fired fine. Most likely it was just the dampness of the tube that um, made the pistols misfire. Um, also held, sorry, one of the <laughs> biggest open houses at the White House. Um, I mean, it was a giant White House kegger pretty much. They had a 1,400 pound block of cheese. Eventually drove everyone outside with tags. And um, during the year 1835, during his presidency, the only time in US history that the National 
national debt was paid off. I mean, he calls it the national curse. So it's actually quite funny also that Andrew Jackson has been recently um, removed from the 20 is actually he was opposed to paying for money himself. Um, and And then why is this parrot here? Well, actually, Andrew Jackson at his funeral, his parrot would actually, that parrot, who was in attendance, would actually have to be removed from the funeral for cursing so much. <laughs> so um, after him, we have Martin Van Buren, their eighth president, the little magician, or as his detractors would say, Martin Van Roon. Um, our first U.S. born president, but the only president whose English was not his native language would be Dutch. And his presidency is actually where we get the term okay from, you know, how do you do okay? Um, his home is called Old Kinderhook. So when he would say, how are you doing? He'd be like, okay. So from Old Kinderhook. And what's quite funny, um, in his 800 page biography, he did not even mention his wife of 12 years once. So I want to give a shout out to Hand Van Buren. <laughs> so uh, did not get a fair share of history. Really not a lot to say about Mother Fillmore or Martin Van Buren. We'll get to Mother Fillmore in a second. Next we have William Henry Harrison. This is an amber type of our ninth president called General Mum. Didn't speak very much. Um, running on the campaign of Lock Cabin and Hard Cider, who was our last president before a British subject. Also, where we get the term keep the ball rolling is actually a campaign rally. They would bring this giant ball bigger than me and kind of just push it around. Why this helped, I don't know. Um, anyways, he would give the longest inaugural address by far, also delivered in the snowstorm, he wouldn't wear a cup. And why do we all know John Quince, um, William Henry Harrison? Well, he was the president that lived for 32 days and then died in office, a little less than life of a fruit fly. Um, so, <laughs> That was the story of um, this, this death scene dying after 32 days. It really didn't make that much of a difference. But apparently, I, I'm so interested in this story of, so he was um, in Tecumseh's war fighting these Indians in the 1820s. He was known as the hero of Tippy Canoe, this bad word, beat Tecumseh. So supposedly on his death, or before his death, obviously, um, Tecumseh would put a curse on him, the curse of Tippy Canoe, which would be Every president elected in a year divisible by 20 would die in office. And for a very long time, this came to be true. I mean, we would have Harrison in 1840 dies in office. Lincoln, elected in 1860, assassinated in office. James A. Garfield, 1880, assassinated in office. McKinley, 1900, assassinated in office. Warren G. Harding, 1920, dies in office. FDR, 1940, dies in office. JFK, 1960, assassinated in office. The curse would eventually be broken when Ronald Reagan in 1981 would survive his assassination attempt. Does the curse really exist? No, probably not, but I'd like to think it does. Okay, so next we have um, Tyler, John Tyler. So, okay, the president had never died in office before. No one really was sure what to do after um, William Henry Harrison died. So no one was sure if he, now the vice president became president or if he was the vice president acting as president. So what happens is this guy, John Tyler, is not fucking around. He is like, and everyone's kind of messing with him. They're like, oh, his accidency. And throughout his presidency, people will um, send him letters. His accidency or vice president acting as president, Tyler. And every time he gets a, um, he will return a letter unopened. You know, he um, had no doubt of his ability to be president. So during Harrison's cabinet, um, he had conferred with his cabinet. You know, he didn't make any decision on his own. And um, the new cabinet, you know, expected him to continue this practice. And the cabinet was quite astounded. And um, when Tyler immediately corrected them with his first speech to his own cabinet, beg your pardon, gentlemen, I'm very glad to have you in my cabinet. Such a able statement as you have provided yourself to be. And I shall be pleased to avail myself of your counsel advice, but I can never consent to being dictated as to what I shall or shall not do. As I, as president, shall be responsible for my administration, I hope to have your hearted cooperation carrying out this measure. So long as you see fit to do this, I shall be glad to have you with me. If you think otherwise, your resignations will be accepted. Also, this guy sired 15 kids. I mean, and he has two living grandkids. Yes. This guy was born in 1890. 
That is one of his grandkids, still alive today, along with another one. Um, but yeah, apparently he had the first team, I think when he was 73, and then his son had one who was 60 something. So after him, we have James K. Polk, known as Young Hickory, sort of Andrew Jackson's protege, the old Hickory. Sometimes said as Polk the Purposeful or Napoleon of the Stump um, about his rousing oratory. Um, often said to be our least known consequential president, promising in just one term to achieve all the agenda he said for. I mean, in his presidency, the country would expand, expand over a million square miles for lands from Texas to California up to Idaho and Washington. Um, once again, all in one term. Dying soon after he left after office, or um, he, there's some thoughts he knew he was gonna die, that's why he didn't run for a second term. Next, we have number 12, old, rough, and ready, um, Zachary Taylor. Really the first general president, um, you know, uh, military general president after Washington. Um, and the election he would win for both presidency would actually be the first he voted for it. Now, the interesting story more than um, old, rough, and ready's life is death, but let me comment on rough and ready. I mean, apparently he would be seen around camp wearing a large straw planter's hat and a very dusty um, coat, and no one even would know he was president or general. So anyways, what would happen is that it seems a little odd, would actually die um, after eating a large serving of cherries and cold milk at the groundbreaking of the Washington Monument. No one was really sure how he died. Actually, in 1991, his body was exhumed as for an assassination. Um, it was later found it was most likely just acute gastroenteritis. Um, it was like in the sewers that contaminated the food and he died. So, with his death comes a man that really was not ready for the presidency. Number 13, Millard Fillmore, the last Whig person. Everyone who's been president since has been either a Democrat or Republican. As one historian says, to discuss Fillmore is to overrate him, so I'll be quick. Um, I have another, I love this book. Fillmore was a pompous, colorless man who rose far beyond his ability. Though his wife, Abigail, so popular at the time that uh, she was actually put on trading cards. Um, and I like that Queen Victoria would remark of him, the handsomest man she ever met. Also looks a ton like Alec Baldwin. I am really waiting for that Millard Fillmore biopic which will probably never come, but I would like to see it. Um, and also, favorite last words of any person, the nourishment is palatable. Who would have to eat a piece of toast, say that, and die? Um, <laughs> after him, we have number 14, Franklin Pierce, AKA Handsome Frank, sometimes said to be our most handsome president. This is him in his uh, Mexican-American war uniform, but I think it best shows his face close to his presidential portrait. Um, known as Purse, no one really would know why they called him Purse. No one really for sure if it was from the Gaston Purchase during his presidency, which gained his lot of lands in New Mexico and Arizona, or that's how he said his last name, Franklin Purse. Um, but I also love his campaign slogan, you know, running under the same party as Polk, you know, in 1844. So they would go, we poked you in 44 and we shall pierce you in 52. And um, the first president to recite his another address completely from memory, the speech being 3,329 words long. Also the first president to uh, have a Christmas tree in the White House. Now, also total alcoholic. Um, yeah, actually once arrested during his presidency for um, running over an old woman drunk in his buggy. And here's a statement from a friend from a night out with uh, Franklin Pierce. <laughs> well, the general and I dined at the Tremont at one o'clock, glass of brandy and water before, pint of champagne at dinner, went to the fairgrounds, returned to the Tremont at five, drank brandy and water until seven and a half, Something Parker's on broiled oysters, beef steaks, and Horny's Claret. Went to the theater, saw Payne Campbell and her daughter in front of Fox and her steak. Returned to Parker's and drank some very old brandy in his private room. Went back to the theater and took possession of some very old um, brandy. And then went for a drum ski and box. And then again to Parker's, had rolled oysters, a bottle of stained wine. Then to the general's room, drank two pints bottles of champagne. Struck or took a stroll about the street and then made a call on Fruit Street where we dispersed some $30 and at four o'clock repaired. Um, not surprisingly, for the first time in history, the party declined not to renominate Pierce. And he famously says, well, there's nothing left to do but get drunk. And he would die 12 years later of cirrhosis of the liver. Um, 
Next president, we have fit number 15, uh, James Buchanan. Known as Ten Cent Jimmy by his detractors. He would say, oh, every living man can live on 10 cents. Um, also often seen, there's some debate on this, but as our worst president of all time, as he would actually be president before Lincoln when um, South Carolina would secede from the Union, beginning off the chain of events that would lead to the Civil War. He was, he always said, he's like, slavery, I mean, he's like, secession, you can't do anything about it, though it's illegal, and he kind of bumbled and led the world on, and the world, yeah, on the crisis that became the Civil War. Also totally unrelated to him being the worst president, often said to be the first homosexual president of all time. We'll never really know as he burned all his papers after his death, but he had a long-standing relationship and lived with this man, William Rufus King, um, senator from Alabama. I mean, everyone kind of derisively referred to them as um, Miss Nancy and I am Fancy. I mean, no one really knew, but one cabinet member who will wipe up would say there was something unhealthy in that president's attitude, and they would all refer to William Rufus King as his better half. Um, but we will really never know if that relationship with large speculation is that yes, they did actually live together. He called it his longtime companion. After him, we have Abraham Lincoln, uh, the rail splitter all day. Yeah, I'm not even going to talk about Abraham Lincoln. We all know him, so I'm just going to completely forget him. Okay, <laughs> number 17, uh, Andrew Johnson. Sir Vito, I mean, Vito with 21 bills more than um, for the most of all time, also known as the Tennessee Taylor and being a tailor from Tennessee. Um, also a big fan of the drink, I mean, getting so drunk at his vice president inauguration, he could barely speak and was said to uh, have a drunken, foolish speech. Okay, so then comes Lincoln's assassination. Actually, Johnson was slated for assassination too, but his assassin, George Asherod, ended up getting too drunk at the bar and um, whipping out and killing him. But then Johnson finds out that Lincoln has been killed, or was dying slowly after being shot at Forest Theater, and he proceeds to get extremely violently drunk himself. Um, but so they said he was really extremely, terribly, and furiously, youthfully drunk. And so they collect him in the morning, and he takes his um, oath of office incredibly hungover, and when he said he was sworn in, had puffy eyes, and his hair was caked with mud from the street. Um, probably most famous, there's the one significant thing from his presidency was he gained Alaska, or as it was known at the time, Russian America. But no one 150 years ago knew about what we'd find in Alaska with its oil deposits and mineral deposits. So they would call it Stewart, Seward's Folly after Secretary of State Seward in the beginning, leading off the train or wheelbarrow. And they would call it Andrew Johnson's Polar Bear Garden, also becoming even closer than Bill Clinton, who was closest president to becoming impeached. Missing by one vote short of the two thirds majority needed for impeachment. Next, we have U.S. Grant, um, Ulysses S. Grant. Actually, not his real name. Real name, Hiram Ulysses Grant. Uh, during the Civil War, in which he was a general, one of probably the most famous, um, a newspaper would misprint his name as U.S. Grant. And well, liking the acronym of U.S. Grant better than Hug, Hiram Ulysses Grant. He stuck with this. He would be known as Unconditional Surrender Grant after Fort Donaldson, saying uh, to the Confederates, I mean, either you surrender unconditionally or we will storm the fort. Also, quite an odd man, painfully, painfully shot. He would, I mean, in this war, everyone would shower together, you know, I mean, it was the army, there was big tent showers, would boast that no one had seen him naked since childhood. I mean, just absolutely shining day in front of anyone. Also quite odd for the leader of some of the bloodiest days of the Civil War. Petrified of the sight of blood. I mean, he couldn't even have a rare steak. Any steak he had would have to be charred. Um, so after becoming the greatest union general of the Civil War, he runs for president. Um, you know, his campaign slogan, vote as you shot. Um, also once uh, pulled over for riding his horse in Budley, buggy too quickly, realizing that the, uh, the president, the man, you know, apologized, the officer, and he, you know, all could ignore the uh, infraction, but Grant was like, I was speeding, you caught me, I'll pay for the ticket, and was fine five dollars, which is about 91 today. So, Grant loved his cigars, I mean, he would be sent boxes of thousands of cigars during the Civil War, would smoke about 12 cigars a day. Um, also would be the first president to famously die 
some previously died of cancer, but we're not 100 percent sure. And what would happen is he had invested in some bad schemes and was going to die. Um, his family going to be in total debt. But five days before his death, he um, he finished writing his autobiography, Grant's Memoirs, which um, are still said to be some of the best presidential memoirs of all time. Um, also near his death, becoming a major fan of cocaine. Yes, not actually cocaine in the sense we think of today, but it was very popular as the sun. Cocaine wine, also a big fan of Queen Victoria. Oh, Vinnie Mariani. Um, okay, and we'll talk about Grant's death a little later. Next, we have Ruth the Fruit B. Hayes. Now, what happened was, I'm not going to get into the whole story, but there was 1876, there was a contested election, there was some behind the door deals, and a lot of people felt that even Samuel Tilden, sort of a push for uh, 2000 scenario, was a little more complicated. Um, no one really felt that he deserved to win the presidency. I actually went to his house this summer on the way to Chicago in uh, Fremont, Ohio. Highly suggested if you're ever in Fremont, Ohio, the Ruth Fruit B. Hayes homestead. Um, but he was called his fraudulency, or Ruth or Fraud, no one really thought he should be president. And who would gain the most ire, even more so than him, was his wife, who would actually ban alcohol in the wife's at the White House, called Lemonade Lucy, for as she would only serve lemonade. And um, not the next president, but his cat. The first Siamese cat brought to America from the American Consulate Bangkok, and appropriately named Siam, or well, what we now know today is Thailand. So then we have James Garfield, elected 1880. I mean, he would entertain his friends by um, having them ask him questions, kind of show off, would write in Latin on one hand and Greek in the other at the same time. Also, our first left handed president. Um, you know, he would, uh, some would say his handshake was a vote early and vote right. But in the end, his downfall would be for a man who had both thought he had voted early and voted right. Charles Ito, this insane man, he somehow had met Garfield and thought they were BFFs, and he deserved the American Council in Paris. I mean, he was completely, everyone was like, no, you're completely insane, we're not giving you the Council in Paris. You know the political right to do anything. So, this guy's crazy. I mean, at one point, Charles Vito would live in a love commune, which was just pretty much sleep with whoever you want. But Charles Vito would directly be called, the girls would say, Charles Vito, you know, please leave. Um, so, Garfield would actually be assassinated um, at the Potomac train station in 1881 by Charles Vito. Um, what happened was actually, although being shot twice, they kind of hit a spongy part of his back, and he would be shot in uh, July and actually linger the whole summer, dying in September. Um, but it was so crazy, it was like, like well, Obama was shot, and we were just every day reading the paper. Well, Obama was alive today, Obama was alive, and pretty much the world went through in 1881. Eventually, what killed him was not the bullet, but um, the sepsis from the wounds. The doctor could kind of stick their fingers in, you know, without this before we knew about really blister or blister and germ theory. But through his death, we actually were able to develop um, Alexander Graham Bell, the metal detector. Though what happened was when they were trying to find the bullet on his body, they didn't realize that the bed spring was actually one of the first metal bed springs. Had that not been true, like most other beds, they might have found the bullet and extracted. Also, through his death, we developed the first indoor air conditioning. So, so becomes Chester A. Arthur, uh, amazing fun and jobs. Um, this man, Prince Arthur, elegant Arthur, known as our dude president. I mean, this man owned 40 pairs of trousers, which he would often change throughout the day, trying to look as snazzy as possible. Um, and 101 years before Rosa Parks, an African-American woman named, named Elizabeth Jennings, um, she was actually a very similar story to uh, Rosa Parks. She was asked to be removed from a New York City trolley um, you know, for sitting in the front. So her case led to the Brooklyn uh, Circuit Court and actually led to the desegregation of all uh, trolley lines. And the person who wasn't a lawyer was no one else but uh, Chester A. Arthur. Also, huge salmon fishing fan. Loved salmon fishing. There's an 1882 fishing trip. So next we have Grover Cleveland, Big Steve as he was called. I mean, he was quite the portly fellow. Um, also known as his obstinacy and by his critics, the Buffalo Hangman, for when he was a constable of Buffalo, hanging two men himself. He called it his moral responsibility. Both are 22nd and 24th president. Um, I'll get to that in a little second. 
One of the most interesting stories of um, Cleveland is actually wearing a child out of wedlock, supposedly. So this lady, um, what was her name? Maria Krolls Halpern would be in Buffalo, apparently would have a child. He would go on Persifery, deny it, but would agree to provide for his life. But later when things weren't going so well, actually sent her to an asylum for the mentally deranged, and it would refer to the whole thing as his woman scrape. Um, but his opponents during his uh, presidential campaign would play on this, and they would say, they would go, Ma, Ma, where's my pa? So then Grover wins. The funniest part of Grover wins on the slogan, Grover the good, honest Grover, and they would say, Ma, Ma, where's my They would say, off to the White House, ha, ha, ha. So, grew up in Cleveland, though he would though go on to marry 21-year-old Frank Folsom during his presidency, so he definitely had some issues with ladies. Um, also, mermaid fucker, present by night, fucker by night. Uh, <laughs> nothing to actually do with Robert Cleveland. Don't know why this is on the internet, don't know if this is a real porno, but wanted to include it. So, when <laughs> leaving the uh, presidency, uh, <laughs> His wife would say to a staff member, well, I want you to take good care of the furniture and ornaments and else, or I want to find everything just as now when we come back again. And the staff member said, what are you talking about? She just lost the election. And she's like, we shall be back in four years. So we'll talk about that in a second. Next, we have Ben Harrington, who beats out uh, Grover Cleveland. Known as the human iceberg or the um, icy Indianian, quite a taciturn little man. Um, though first president would have his voice recorded. Um, though also the grandson of William Henry Harrison. Uh, so, though Frederick Douglass would say, to my mind, we have never had a greater president talking about his elections to get the African American vote. Um, his voting efforts for the election though should endear him to the colored people as long as he lives. I don't know what um, Frederick Douglass thought of Lincoln, but definitely thought this man was the greatest president. Also, someone that also next to John Quincy's best presidential pets is two pet possums, Mr. Reciprocity and Mr. Protection. Also had a goat named Old Whiskers, which he would kind of let run around on a buggy on the front White House lawn. And the last little fun fact about him is um, first president to have electricity in the White House. And the old electricity switch were not these little switches that you kind of know how to go pressy thing but was so afraid of being electrocuted, he never actually turned on the lights and had um, his servants do it. And, well, uh, he didn't win the next election, and Grover came back. So, becoming now our 22nd and our 24th president. But a very interesting thing would happen during his 24th presidency. One day, Grover's walking around, here's 1893. We've just had the panic of 1893, which was sort of a 2008 financial crisis, um, look, not as bad, but he feels this bump on the roof of his mouth. And he's like, oh shit, like, this is, a little pop. This is cancer. Um, and they can't tell the world, this can't just walk with kind of cancer growth on my mouth. Um, because we just had a panic in 1893, and the world would go, the US especially would go into the chaos. But again, and especially after Grant's death of cancer. I read a book um, last summer, The President is a Sick Man, which you would think a a whole book on Grover Cleveland, but actually one of the best I've ever read. Um, and, you know, cancer, the, the world was stymied by this cancer phobia. They would say of cancer, they're like, all we know is that we know nothing. Um, it would be a lot like AIDS a century later when no one, in the beginning, no one really knew what was going on. I mean, even the first cancer hospital wouldn't even be called a cancer hospital, just um, the uh, oncology center. And um, it was even, it was just no, it was even called cancer, it was called the dread disease, which was the disease. And it was quite the death sentence. So what happens is Grover Cleveland stealthily goes out on a yacht and he's on a fishing trip during his presidency, gets the cancer removed, and no one is the wiser. And here's actually uh, his root mouth before and after a few years later field. And actually, if you go to Philadelphia at the Mooter Museum, you can see the cancer. What's so interesting is the story is this man, E.J. Edwards, the Philadelphia Inquirer, gets the uh, secret scoop. He's like, Grover Cleveland, the cancer got it secretly removed, and this is a fiasco for the political people, political people of Cleveland. I mean, they completely deny it. Um, this never happened, and this man, E.J. Edwards, his life is ruined. He is, I mean, he dies or runs loose in a pariah called a liar. He's now ever really Grover the Good, a liar about having cancer. Finally, in 1916, after almost all their deaths, the last man of the um, 
surviving man of the cancer removal team would go on to vindicate Edwards. And if anyone has a, wants to read a little more about the Grover Cleveland, I'll just project, suggest the president is a sick man. Um, okay, now we're gonna finally end up with our last and 25th president, William McKinley, to his detractors known as Wobbly Willie, I mean Roosevelt, and Roosevelt sent him no more backbone than a chocolate eclair. Um, this would all be before he became the famous imperialist of the Spanish-American War. Um, also, he would win his uh, first election despite um, the fact that he would campaign from the room of uh, the front porch of his uh, first front porch campaign. Um, in Ohio, his opponent would travel extensively by rail train, speaking over 600 events. And, well, Garfield would also be assassinated. Uh, McKinley would also be assassinated at uh, the Pan American Exposition in Buffalo in 1901. Sadly, the entire spot has been demolished since, sort of like the Columbia Exposition in Chicago. Now there's just a small grand stone in the middle of someone sort of next to someone's driveway marking the spot in the shot. This man, Leon Chogos, would uh, shoot him in the chest. He would only last about seven days, not been during the whole summer. Um, the man was an anarchist and thought that, you know, killing McKinley um, would change the world, didn't really do anything. And of course, as we all know, Teddy Roosevelt became president. Uh, I mean, right before, though, there's this whole story that McKinley would always wear this lucky carnation in his uh, hell pocket and would actually give it to this girl, this small girl, a few seconds or minutes before um, being shot himself. So, uh, but then, you know, so McKinley, kind of a good guy, I mean, so he gets shot, and then the crowd, everyone around him rushes uh, Leon Chogols and starts attacking him. He goes, you know, he's, he killed his guy. He didn't know for poor fellow, he didn't know what he could have done. You know, leave him alone. He goes, go easy on him, boys. Um, and he was dying seven days later and ushering the president of um, Teddy Roosevelt. So that's about it for Presidents 1825 to 1901. I want to give a few shout outs to Calvin Coolidge and Warren G. Hardy, who I didn't really get to cover because of some good interesting stories. Also to James Madison, who was one of the founding fathers, was kind of, but didn't get really covered here. Um, and also to Taft, who I really would have liked to cover because I didn't want to get into Roosevelt that would have explained on a little too long. And I think that's it.